Okay, welcome to, uh, I think it's the 28th Phototech lecture, and uh, we're happy to have uh, Uwe Steinmuller back for his third lecture in the series on, uh, on some very interesting high dynamic range work. Take it away, Uwe. Yeah, thank you very much. I uh, do introduction a little bit later. Uh, just to understand, a year ago, I, I, you know, I thought HDR, okay, and I thought, what, why to bother? And today I, I'm quite excited about it, but sometimes for a different reason than many people think, because in the end I only care about images, and that's why, where, what I want to start today with a slideshow of images, which are done all the way I discuss things, and I want to end with pictures, so that it reminds us that it's about photography. <coughs> So all of these images have one thing in common, or most of them. They were all taken at very strong sunlight. This is normally the light where we left the cameras in the bags in the past. So that's how it's related to what we are talking today. Uh, so first a little bit about what is the problem about dynamic range, contrast, classic solution to the problem, because the problem is there forever. So there are solutions in the past about merging exposures, tone mapping, and actually the key is what I call today high-speed HDR. And mix and match, we see, and then we have some time for question and answers. I hope we get quite a bit of time. This is a, it's very important to understand, this is a photographer's perspective. I can tell you, if you want to be very technical, you would have probably to do the rest of your life enough work to solve all the problems. And there is a lot of work done very much in the academic area, and it has still to go into the real world of photographers. I, I don't really use techniques which may be there in five years. That's not really something I'm interested in today. But HDR is there today, and that's, that's a good thing. Uh, just a little introduction, I'm the editor and owner of outbackphoto.com. It's a pretty large website on fine art digital photography. I do that now for over seven years. And it's about workflow, it's about cameras, it's about printing, it's about, yeah, it's actually everything from shoot to a final print out there. Uh, we start now in October with a series, or I hope it ends up to be a series of workshops where we teach in hands-on using the techniques I outlined today. So uh, making use of HDR in the real world. 
and not just in fantasy, but with the goal to get fine art prints. So it is not just to have a wonderful small JPEG on the internet. The problem, you know, it's very clear that the tonal range in the scene and the tonal range that normal output media can handle are very different. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think a normal sunlit scene outside can, outside can easily get up to one to 10,000 or more in dynamic range in the ratio of the darkest and the brightest point where you can see detail. And of course, this is a very old problem. Uh, the, one of the major solutions of photographers was not photographing at that light. So it's, uh, it's, it's a very good solution. Because why would you photograph something you cannot capture? We get to that. So it, it's, of course, not uh, uh, unique to photographers. So painters have to deal, deal with it also. But they try to do something like, uh, if you know, they all also avoid it to have Clipping. Clipping for them would be that the canvas would be just white. You know, they, they normally paint on something. Yeah, and the brightest thing they can actually, yeah, good, the brightest thing they can do is actually getting the whitest white they can paint. The photographer can get normally the whitest white is what the paper white is. You cannot go beyond that. So, uh, except of some very graphic paintings, you don't see many paintings which have a lot of canvas just there. It, it makes sense, but you know. And the same is true for photography. Most photos won't work if you see, let's say, 70% the paper white and the rest is some sort of other shade. If I had this discussion in the past. Of course, you can do that if you have a strong message in the rest. But it's not the normal thing. Uh, one common problem is, you know, uh, you run out of uh, uh, dynamic range in the shades. Yeah, the shades are both areas. Actually, highlights and shadows are the key points. The midtones tell the the content, and the shadows and the highlights give the finesse. So, if the shadows are bad, too bright, too dark, too muddy, too whatever, uh, you lose the image. It's actually, the, in my opinion, the, the easier part in some way. Because you can solve it by saying, OK, I don't show that detail and make it just black. The highlights is not so easy. Because uh, when the highlights don't show detail, they just look blotchy. It's, as I say, you have paper white. In, because you have a certain range you can put onto paper, if you put a lot of, of that dynamic range into the midtones, you have nothing left for the highlights and nothing left for the shadows. Uh, and this is for a photographer, it means you, you have to experiment a lot uh, to find your solution. So dynamic range, the ratio of darkest and brightest element that can be shown in an image, show means it has detail. It said outdoors it can be very high. Uh, but indoors with an open window, it can be even way beyond that. Yeah? So that you want to show the inner of a room and show the scene outside the window. By the way, artistically, I haven't seen many compelling images to do that. Yeah? So it is a different thing to, yeah, that you can do that and make an image which yeah, either the inner is not meaningful or the outer is not meaningful. You have to have both very meaningful. Uh, the other end is uh, kind of the opposite, is the low contrast, which is also challenging, but it's obviously not a high dynamic range uh, challenge. So in principle, you have what is seen referred. That is what is there. That is the contrast range it's there. And that is the contrast range you have to manage, whatever you do. And then think of you want to print. And I come from the perspective that everything I want to do has to be printable. It's very different when you just want to have a nice look on your monitor. And there are spe even special monitors where you can see 1 to, one th uh, uh, one to 30,000 dynamic range on the monitor. But still, you can't do it on paper. And I don't see any way 
uh, this will change. So a dynamic range of 1 to 250 is actually quite high for a paper. So you have to match what is there to the paper. And up front, the one solution, that, or this is not a solution, is to clip the data when you capture them. Because again, if you get them to the printing, you can, have, can decide whether you have paper white or uh, a, a, an ugly gray on that. Because there's no data. You don't know what's in there. So there's no detail. So there are a lot of factors like smoothness, like brilliance. So, but that's then a matter of taste. But still, the problem is as old as photography. How do I get a scene I like mapped to the output medium I like? And as I say, if you look at matte paper, they may have 1 to 60 dynamic range. It's hardly existing. So very important that you understand that detail is shown by contrast. If you don't see something in contrast to something else, it may be there, but you don't see it. So your eyes look for contrast. And the classic ways, you know, the old curves and level stuff is global contrast. Global contrast is very difficult because you know if you, if you add contrast to something, you have to take it away on something else because there's so much contrast you have and you cannot enhance it. That's where local contrast plays a big role, which is you, and I get to that with a sample chart, to illustrate that local contrast is a very powerful way to still give contrast without uh, uh, having running out of contrast in terms of the global way to think of it. But then there's obviously, if you want to have things smooth, that's just the opposite to contrast. So you, you want a gradient, yeah? And if you have to cater with both, both. And color contrast is probably used by, by uh, painters probably also by photographers, but you are very much depending on the scene whether it has the color contrast unless you change the color radically. Nothing wrong with it, but uh, so it's not, it's not that much usable in photography working with color contrast because the painter invents the color. He decides what it is. So he can make colors which have actually in the, in the tonal range very little contrast, good contrast in terms of uh, colors. So the two columns of dots have a pairs of equal values. So this is as bright as this. But we both know, we all know that this one looks much brighter. So what the eye does, it, it works completely different. It doesn't look, oh, what is the uh, RGB value or whatever, the brightness value of something? It looks where is it contained? So you, you need much less difference in brightness in the dark area for, for bright pixels than in the highlights, where you need strong differences to, just to see them. And this is important that more and more new techniques uh, improve local contrast. And there's also a limit to it. it. It has to look what, when I discuss it later a little bit, what is called natural. This is actually, I assume over the next 10 years, this term will change because I think it's, it starts with the wrong premises, what is natural. So the goal is to map the whole white outside scene, 1 to 30,000, let's say, to 1 to 250, and global contrast is not the solution. It's one part of it. But local contrast is the other part of the solution and way more powerful. Yeah? So it is more, it adapts to the way you see. Yeah? It is just, and, and you know, also this technique is not very new. It's done by Dodge and Byrne and all that. I, I get to that probably soon. Okay. 
I had that in the, I think, in a previous ta uh, talk here, but I think it's very important. In, in, in photo editing, we all very often talk about shadows. And it has actually very little to do with what we call the shadow. A shadow is not lit by the primary light source. It is lit by a secondary light source. It is kind of darker. But this image, and that's why I like it, shows that the numbers here are in bright sunlight. They are not in the shadows, but still darker than the real shadows which are in here. Yeah? So I still wait for tools which can distinguish that. Because you don't want to brighten the black letters. They are that black. But you may want to brighten the shadows. Yeah? Uh, I don't think anything today can distinguish that. Yeah? In global contrast, not at all. Yeah? It can't even find out what it is. Yeah? Because it, it just treats every pixel the same, wherever that it is. So it just doesn't help with the, how the eyes see. Yeah? It, it is a very brute force method, if you look. Yeah? OK, the classic solutions are to control the light, fill light. We, are, over the last couple of years, we've always got out at overcast. That limits the dynamic range, so you could photograph. You wait for the gold light. So that is not so harsh. But on the other side, you have harsh shadows. So it's, it's you know, uh, or you, in the, in the past, they used graduated gray filters. But you know, not all transitions between bright areas and dark areas are straight. And it's kind of a hassle to do that. The other is, and a very classic technique is, which actually deals with the local contrast, is to use dodge and burn to darken areas and brighten areas in a, in a photo just for the purpose of its visual appearance. But dodge and burn is a lot of work. Uh, no, nothing wrong with that something is a lot of work. But today we have some algorithms which do a good job. They don't replace dodge and burn, but they, instead of doing it on hot, in 100 cases, you may not, may not use it in two cases. Because these local contrast enhancers, they, they help uh, to do by algorithms what you want. OK, so now the first thing is, how do we capture wider dynamic range? Of course, it's pretty easy. The ideal solution is we would have cameras which would do it. This is just not the case, except of very special cameras. So if you, have a very, if you are very lucky, you may get a dynamic range of 1 to 1,000 in your camera. And they get better, because you know, uh, there is very often the discussion, of, oh, yeah, this camera at that noise level, and this, and this, and that. And then other people say, why bother about the noise? Because I only use ISO 200. But actually, the noise is a limiting factor to the dynamic range which a camera can capture. That's all about it. What is the darkest detail it can capture where the signal is still positive compared to the noise? Yeah? So, which means if we have high ISO cameras with very little noise, this means we have a higher dynamic range even if you only photograph ISO 100. Yeah? And it, it said if you open up shadows, your ISO 100 shot will soon show the noise of an ISO 800 shot, because you, you dig more and more in the deep shadows. Black and white negative film, I think, some say it captured about 12 f-stops. Uh, digital cameras are. 8 to 10. Uh, there are some special cameras. One is a, the SphereCam HDR. They claim 26 f stops but it's a very special camera for, for uh, 360 degree uh, panorama. So it's, it's nothing really uh, of interest for, for us as photographers. What's the dynamic range of a typical lens? 
I, I never looked into that. What, what, you mean what contrast can we produce? What? Yes, what, what, what's the dynamic range of a typical lens? Because eventually you get ghosting in lens flare, regardless of this, what the sensor does. Yeah, uh, but I, I think we are way before the lim that the lens is limiting on that side. It's limiting on other sides. You will see that on, on, on artifacts, yeah? But in, I'm, I'm not run into that, but uh, let's take for, I, I don't know. But I don't think it's, uh, it's in the moment a limiting factor. So the solution is to have multiple exposures. Uh, and there are different uh, techniques. Uh, most of them are based that you shoot on a tripod. It has to be a good tripod. It has to be stable and all that. You have to use all the techniques to avoid as much camera shake as possible. But you would be surprised how much a normal SLR shakes without the mirror going up, just by the shutter. Yeah? And, and you use camera bracketing uh, uh, very often in, in, in two EV steps. You can do three, five, seven, or whatever. And this is actually the essence uh, of the problematic is uh, all moving objects are a problem. First of all, the camera movement itself, but that's less of a problem than objects in the scene. And uh, whatever you look, there's a lot of movement <laughs> in our world. Yeah, flags are one. Uh, it's kind of interesting, you know. Uh, you try to f photograph a building, and everything is wonderful, uh, stable. But then there's a flag, so uh, you you get go what is called ghosting anyway. Yeah, Phot photographers very often talk about good and bad light. It's actually they don't really talk about the light. They talk about their capability to make photos at this light. So there's nothing really wrong with sunlight. Sunlight is very good light. But if it's too strong and the contrast is too strong, you just can't capture it. So that's annoying. But not because the light is bad. No, because your technologies to capture at that light are not up to it. Uh, so you, and, and this is what we, now for probably three months, we, we changed, we photograph at light where we didn't photograph before. And uh, I talk about that in the end a little bit more in detail. So let's assume there would be no problem and everything would be perfect with HDR. Merging would be trivial, movements no issue, and everything. Yeah? We would live in a wonderful world because we would capture all that light, and then we would kind of remap it with some fancy algorithms to a printable range. And in this way, we can actually redefine the light which exists. And I think the movie industry does it for quite a while. They shoot what is called day for night. They shoot at day. And, shine, uh, and change the light characteristics so that it looks like as if it was shot by at night. In the past, it was done with filters and special lenses. Today, it's done digitally in the post-processing. Yeah? And it's, I think they are sometimes very good so that you don't see it. So in some way, if you would have, just think of a camera which doesn't really exist that would capture all the characteristics of the light and the scene you could then have software which would say, OK, what if it's 7 PM? What if it's 4 PM? Yeah? What if the sun comes from a different direction? You, uh, all that. Yeah? Uh, it sounds fiction, but uh, in, in the movie industry, they get to a certain point. But in, in photography, you know, in some way, we are also a little bit more demanding, because you see the pictures steady there. You see it here. You see all the artifacts, all the artificial results of it when you look at it. In the movie, it, it fades by. Yeah? So it's not, it, and, and also, of course, in the movie industry, it's uh, 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 a lot of research done there. But I think they do some good job. And I think we, in some way, we can learn from the movie people the way that 
they distinguish between what is the light when they shoot and what can they do with the shot, with shot footage in post-processing to create the light they want. And there's nothing, in my opinion, wrong with it. It's just that they define the mood they want. And whether they manage to do it at that point or later, uh, if the result is good, doesn't matter. Uh, the thing is, the main reason that they do that is economics. Because let's assume they have a movie which has many scenes which should be all shot at 5 p.m. This would mean they would shoot at 5 p.m. every day. And the weather is not cooperating, all that. But the reality is they shoot at 12, what should look like 5 p.m. Because the, the storyboard doesn't tell, oh, we didn't have time at, 12, at 5 p.m. Let's put the scene at 12 p.m. You know, that doesn't really make sense for, for a storyboard. And I, I think we can learn a lot from, from that thinking. And we have now to explore what, what is possible in the, in the digital photography arena. Yeah, I want to cover that because it's kind of interesting. Uh, on the internet, there are especially on Flickr, HDR images, and people say, oh, they are not real. And you know, and, you know in, in some cases, I may agree. But the interesting thing is people judge images by looking at other photos to tell these photos are not real. I tell you what, photos are very little real. We are just used to it because we know the whole world just from photos. We don't know the world. We know photos of the world. So this is a reality now. So we, we never think in, in Venice, oh, how does it look to our eyes? But of course, we know the emotions. And we can say, does this photo transport the emotion? And that's what we should judge the final photo at. So what is real is defined by a very unreal standard, which is photos. First of all, it's 2D. 2D is not really real, is it? I don't think so. And uh, we look different at scenes. We, we uh, zoom into th things and see things. So uh, we, we should be careful with saying just, oh, this is unreal, and my photo is really real. I tell you, your photo is very unlikely real. There's no real photo. That's just the point. So you may l not like one. That's OK. So try to uh, create the photos you like. And don't let that limit by. Oh, it, it just, photos look that way. Yeah, so you guys get sometimes very surreal HDR photos, which I think are very real because they transport a mood. Yeah, it's more like painting. So merging exposures. Uh, sounds so easy and obvious, OK. Uh, but there are more reasons that it fails than anything else. It's always if you. Uh, cut something into parts, put it together, yeah? Try to cut a leg into three parts and put it together. It's, it's not really trivial. And that's with everything you, you cut, putting together is hard. In photographs, it would be very easy as really nothing moves. First of all, the camera moves. But this can be done with sophistic, sophisticated alignment techni techniques. Uh, you know, you, you can move this way. This way, you can rotate. You can move this way. So there's a lot of movement involved. Fortunately, I think a lot of research was done in, uh, in the context of stitching, because they have the same problem. They put things together, not on top of each other, but beside of each other, and partly on top. So the other thing is moving object, which is called ghosting, which means ghosting because if you just put them on top of each other, you have ghost images of the objects on top of each other. But there are clearly benefits. If everything works, you get lower noise. Because with the overexposed shot, you actually photograph for the shadows. And in the underexposed shots, you photograph for the highlights. So you preserve highlights. You get lower noise. And that can be a very good reason to use it. I use only raw, but. For HDR, JPEG may work, because you don't run into the typical JPEG dynamic range 
limitation because you have the highlight data again from the underexposed shot and the shadow data from the overexposed shot. Many things move, and you know, the more, I, I probably shot about 1,000 triplet shots, 1,000 shots times three over the last three months, uh, and it's, it's surprising what, what moves. People are kind of obvious animals, you know, uh, you look at your merge image and say, oh, there's dust on the sensor. No, it's a bird. Uh, uh, because it's, if it's flying fast, it's on three shots at different yeah, areas. And uh, especially you know, in the sky, it's not really a problem. But once it's on top of a structure, uh, you have to be careful to get rid of it. Foliage moves, of course, anyway. Flags, I uh, uh, mentioned that. Clouds are kind of an interesting exception because they are kind of organic, so you, you, you don't know how they look before and after because they just merge somehow. They, they can be actually nice. Water is a little bit more tricky, and I'm not still clear uh, how much I can do. It can look interesting, and uh, I mentioned camera. Um, go just briefly, merging exposures, you have three exposures. You run a software like Photoshop or Photomatics where you open the files, and the software does an automatic, if you want, alignment, and you get an HDR file, which has the dynamic range captured in all, all three or five or whatever images. Then you have a really, really ugly file. The problem is the file is not really ugly. It is just that your monitor cannot show it, because uh, a normal monitor, let's assume you have one to 500 dynamic range, cannot show the full range you captured. Yeah? And you can do tricks to make it a little bit more suitable for your monitor. Uh, there's still a lot to learn on color management. Uh, but actually, you are not really interested in this. At least I'm not interested in the HDR file. The 3D people are only interested in the HDR file, or mainly interested in it. But I'm not interested in it. I just use it to tone map it down. It's just my, I have captured the material. I have the dynamic range of all which was in that scene, if I had enough shots to capture it. So the key thing is to do what is called tone mapping. Some also, or it's, I think, technically very often called operators. And here, we will see many, many techniques over the next years. Already in the academic world is flooded with it. But flooded can also mean you have an algorithm which is wonderful if you have the patient to wait a day for a single image to be processed. So it, it, as always in digital photography, in workflow, you have wonderful algorithms, but they have to brought, be brought to kind of a real-time metaphor where you can actually see what you do. Yeah? Interactive programs really stop if after every step you have to wait a minute. That's not what I would call interactive. Actually, five seconds look fa uh, long. It, you know, I, I live with it any time as long as I don't know there's something which does it faster. Yeah, it, 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 of course. Yeah, I, I'm in the moment, my workflow was much faster than now. I'm kind of in, in the stone ages of HDR workflow, which is tedious compared to the old workflow, but I do it for the purpose. Yeah, but I promise you in three years it will be faster. So it, this is an incentive to make it faster. Yeah. And if. If you would have gotten at that time a developer and a solution which would do it in third of the time, this would be a hit in the market, I, I tell you. Yeah? Yeah? But it didn't happen. You know? But then you could also say, why don't we all use our class glass plates? You know? You know, do everything yourself. So you know, speed is a speed matters. Yeah? Speed matters in the terms of I, I don't say if you have you are fast, you get better results. I didn't say that. Yeah? But you, can, you have more room to experiment. You, you can do five experiments instead of one. And this can be beneficial. This is one respect in which a photographer will leave painting in the dust, huh? Huh? 
In, in this respect, photography will leave painting in the dust. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, so, tone mapping, uh, there are some nice tone mappers out there, but I think we will, we will see a lot in, uh, improvement there. Uh, there's one uh, which is important, uh, the photomatics detail enhancer is, uh, is what I, is local contrast enhancement. So local contrast is kind of pulling out details. As I said, if you have a local contrast, you see a detail. It, it's kind of like sharpening. It's not quite like sharpening. It's a little bit more on a coarser level of detail. It is not the fine edge detail only. Uh, there's an interesting algorithm implemented in Photoshop, CS2 and CS3. It, I find it a little bit too tedious, but uh, because I have to manipulate these curves and get luckier sometimes, I don't know. But it's kind of interesting, you know. Uh, if you would have asked me a year ago, oh, uh, what about noise and what about chromatic aberrations? And I would say, yeah, I don't have really problem with chromatic aberrations. I don't have really problem with noise. Now I have problem with chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration is lenses are not made perfect. So if more to the corners, the three uh, red, green, and blue focus at different places. So you get these purple and green seams and uh, seams, and some are blue and yellow. You can be very ugly. Because you overexpose shots, you, you, you force it. So you get it more into your face now. So if, if you have chromatic aberration on your lenses, and believe me, there are not many without, uh, you will see it now. It's amplified into your face. So that's why raw converters like camera raw are so important to have features to remove chromatic aberrations. Because you don't want that before it get merged into HDR. Otherwise, you see it into your face. And also, you sometimes see the wide halos around things. Because you know uh, these, these algorithms looking for uh, local contrast, they look, oh, what is the surrounding? And that's sometimes defined by a certain radius or so. And there, they are a little bit off. Ghosting, I don't want to get into that because I don't think there's a tool which does it really for what I would like to have. Yeah? I mentioned that before. The whole HDR and tone mapping is very good in terms of noise. Because let's assume you have a minus 2 EV, 0, and plus 2 EV. You get the shadows of the plus EV. You get it two f-stops better than the normal shot, and four f-stops better than the underexposed shot. So uh, it, you, it, you can really see it. So that's one of my main reasons to use HDR is that if I photograph dark windows, I want to see a little bit inside into the windows. I would like to get as low noise as possible. And even at ISO 200, on a very good camera, you see it. This kind kind of was an uh, incidental experiment. You know, I I shot handheld from a cliff, uh, an automated high speed bracket, and uh, the left image shows how the images are on top of each other, and I blended a little bit through, so it's very blurred. But it was the wind was so strong that I couldn't even handheld it. Okay, someone can say use a tripod. Ever heard of tripods and wind that it's also, you know, you can take a studio tripod, a kind of 50 pound or so. Maybe it would not shake, but so tripod wouldn't have helped. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, would not have helped at all. But then with alignment, I got that pretty much in, the, in alignment. Yeah, so it, and, and the, but this was interesting and that's why I show it. This is kind of the worst scenario. You know, I, this was a really, the, the main problem was that my hair is pushed into my eyes and everything. So it was really on a cliff at Davenport in front. It was really, you know, where you could hardly hold the camera, you know? And the alignment in, in CS2, uh, CS3 uh, is pretty good, which did the other thing there. So what I call high-speed HDR is actually 
using cameras which have a high frame rate. So I'm not a sports photographer. So normally I'm, I don't care about speed. But it's clear, it's clear that if you, if you shoot three frames fast, less can move in between the frames, including yourself. If you shoot it slower, more outside. I, had, I shot birds sitting on something. And you know, birds are normally not really that set, even if they are sitting. And it was quite well in focus, so not, not really blurred. If, if you would do that from a tripod and have a 10 second sequence of your shots, you can be sure the bird would have moved. And I just brought the camera for the purpose. This is a slow sequence of about three frames per second, just to get an idea. That's slow. And it's still not, not sounds good, three frames per second. So, and you know, the, the, what I like about this is this is a consumer grade camera, $1,300, yeah? This is now a little bit higher, yeah? And that makes a big difference. So now I, I shoot th these sequences, and I have a camera which does 10 frames per second. This is six and a half. But a six and a half is way good, I would say, yeah? So this got me thinking that, isn't it interesting to try handheld? Yeah, because uh, it gives me the chance that things in the scenes don't move. Yeah, of course, I have to have short shutter, shutter speeds, so it's nothing for night photography or overcast or, you know, it has to be bright light. And that's what we did recently a lot. So this way, you, you have very little camera movement. And in the scene, everything which moves slow is kind of in focus. And as I said, I did about 1,000 triple shots over the last three months. And we are not really prolific photographers, so we, we have photograph uh, either we on a trip or what we call walk portfolios in, in San Francisco where we just observe. And the interesting thing is it changed the photography at all because I don't even look really what images I got. Because I shoot three frames, so I, when I get to that, I'm kind of sure I got somewhere the exposure I want. So what I do is I, I'm more, we are more like curious children looking for things to capture. It's, it, the, the process is completely deferred to home, yeah? Because of these three exposures. So you don't, you don't actually take what uh, correct exposure, you take minus two thirds, plus two thirds, plus two? In the moment, it is very often minus one, plus one, or minus one and a third, plus two and a third, and zero. Okay. No, I, I take a correct one. This, it, it, I, oh, yeah, yeah, no, this is, a, this, this, this series, sequence, it was two third. It's kind of also then uh, with an exposure compensation. This is because I used on that camera highlight priority where you, where you underexpose implicitly. Yeah? It's a little bit more. Uh, I want to tell so much about highlight recovery. It's kind of interesting that the raw file actually holds more data on the highlight than very often you see at zero EV exposure. It, it's beyond what we talked today, but I learned that it's not making up these data. These are data which are really there in the file. Yeah? So, which means, for example, with, the, 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 with some cameras, you have more dynamic range in the file than you see immediately. And the S5 is really quite something. Give you an example. How, you know, on the left is the zero EV shot, this one. And this is a minus three EV correction. You know, you, you would say, couldn't you learn to get better exposure? Okay, but I, I tell you to my excuse, I was photographing manually with manual exposure settings, ducks in a window in Chinatown. And then I felt that some dust was in the air. I had no clue what it is. I turned around and found that the feathers of these chicken were flying in the air. 
yeah? And I photographed in strong sunlight, yeah? But what I want to show is not to encourage to use that, but I could nearly recover everything on that shot. And that's amazing. It's, it, that's the Fuji S5. So that's, uh, there's no other camera which can do that. This is another example where you, you, the dark areas are the, the normal ones. No, the bright are the normal ones. The dark are the recovered ones, which uh, show what, what you can do uh, to get capture the dynamic range. You, know, you have the dark shadow on the one side and the bright on the other, which was also overexposed. OK, the last topic I want to talk is, is what I call exposure mix and match. So I kind of combine, or we kind of combine, a classic old technique, which is bracketing, with HDR. In some way, we capture three frames. That doesn't mean we use all three frames. But we can. So we are kind of HDR ready. So. Uh, th this is an example bracket, yeah? You see it's uh, uh, how it was recorded. And I uh, showed the histogram so that you get an idea uh, what the exposure situation was in, the, in these shots. And uh, it's kind of interesting, then, you know, Dick, we didn't get to the answer of that question, so I can ask that before I show the solution. I actually can recover the brightest shot. So, so which means I would have all the de data I wanted in the brightest sh uh, shot, best shadows and all highlights. What could be a reason that this shot would still be not the good one? No, 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 because the shadows are from the brightest shot. So you, you cannot get better you cannot get better shadows than from the than from the brightest shot. That's not possible. Yeah, no, you been the combining, but, but let, okay. But leave that out for a moment. But it's not the key. I think the key is okay, I give the answer. The problem is this is the longest exposure. And it has if if you run out of it, the most camera shake. So this is actually motion blurred in this image. Yeah, because the unexposed has the least motion blur because it has the shortest shutter speed. The middle one has half or less than half the shutter speed. In the third has the longest, or no, it doubles the shutter shutter speed. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the main problem is actually motion blur, and I find that very often if I, because you know we switch scenes, and you, if you photograph into a darker area, you have that all the time. Uh, I, I made here a little uh, a diagram where we, we, I go to the, the down part, where I, I, I wrote down what are the things to consider if you shoot, but let me go to that. First of all, you look at the overexposed shot. Can you recover it? Can you do highlight recovery and get everything from it in a good way? Highlight recovery can also introduce artifacts. If no, you go to the next shot, because it means this shot doesn't help you alone. Is there motion blur? You have to go to B anyway, because this is not a usable shot for anything you do, because it has motion blur. The same you are going now for the shot B, for the middle exposure. And if it can be recovered, you could think of doing, merging B and C, or also A, in the case it doesn't have motion blur. That's what I call mix and match. You can look at all these exposures, and you know that's, you get that pretty fast. And one, of course, important thing is, are there moving objects? If there are moving objects, you have to settle with one of these exposures. And the worst is, if you cannot use B, which I rarely found in the moment. I, I could use most of the time exposure B. And C has incredible noise, then you are in trouble. Yeah? So 
that's what I call mix and match. Yeah, so that you can, you have the material to do either HDR if you want and can, or you have three very good exposures to choose from or uh, to choose the best one. Uh, a little bit outlook, which is kind of the interesting side effect of shooting these brackets, can be, or I would say will be, that you couldn't, cannot only use these shots for uh, HDR, you could use them for improving resolution. There's a technique called super resolution where you shoot multiple images. You combine them for a higher resolution image. So in this case, it's actually mandatory that you have some movement. If Let's assume you would really shoot the perfect constant shot. It wouldn't work because you know, it, it, it wouldn't get more information from it. And I have seen images where you really see more but unfortunately, I saw also way more chromatic aberrations. Yeah, and the, the tool I have at the moment, which is called Photo Acute, so it's working, but in the moment, it works only from raw, which sounds good, but because they don't remove, for most lenses, the proper chromatic aberrations, it is not usable in many cases. They will do TIFF version soon, and I want to look again. So the, the nice thing is you, you can, at some point, even use these brackets to get a 20 megapixel resolution out of a 10 megapixel camera. And that's not fiction, that's real. Yeah, it's not, it, it is just algorithm. <coughs> Conclusions, uh, it's a useful technique today. I think there's a lot of work to be done, improved workflow, better tone mapping, better lens correction, better ghost removal, higher dynamic range in cameras. And uh, I recently stumbled about a term called um, uh, computational photography or something like that. At some point, we are kind of at a point where you don't really take the photo you want to see. You take data to make the photo you want to see. And this is just the beginning. I, I, we wait for when you get rid of lenses. Yeah? Actually, there are already techniques where you don't have lenses. Yeah? Where you actually photograph things which are not giving kind of a, like a camera a ready image. It gives data which can be manipulated to an image. And someone told me you know, the difference between the human eye and, for example, the eyes of um, flies. Look at that. The single cell of a fly doesn't really get an image. It gets information to the brain to do something with that information. And we are at the point where you capture at some point data which will make up an, an image. And I think HDR is in some way near that. Uh, it just, you know, I, I don't want to miss that. Uh, uh, I just find some final images, and I, I, I was not prepared to run nearly out of time. And all these images were done with this camera on one walk at harsh sunlight. Harsh. Sunlight. Okay, I have to say that uh, they, we also use, I also use a style which is called colorizing, so it's, it is not your average color image. It's kind of blend of black and white and 
color. I, I, I like that. It's actually, you have the full color image and it's just superimposing a black and white layer, which blends it. So open for questions. So what are the best tools for doing HDR? Uh, I have a, a whole section on my website on, on, on HDR. There's nothing like the best tool. Uh, it merged to HDR, I very often use Photoshop CS3 for it, but it has limitations where it doesn't just have artifacts which you don't want. And uh, uh, so I use mainly Photomatics and uh, um, uh, Photoshop. And Photoshop doesn't have a tone mapping algorithm I, I care about that much. But photomatics is pretty good. And it's not too expensive, so. I've got a, a, a few resources here I'd like to bring up. One is uh, the Jupleum at 360vr.com slash HDR for dummies has a thing he calls HDR for dummies, which um, takes two bracketed shots and merges them together in Photoshop with using uh, I think it's the hard light operator or something like that, which is pretty. Um, which is one, not high dynamic range, you just get it it's right. It's not high dynamic range, it just it's allows blending. you to open up the shadows. Yeah, but it's blending. It's kind of a tone mapping or to, a tone remapping, if you want. Right, it basically gives you the most detail, whatever. And it only works for two images, but it's fast and it works well as long as the images are well aligned. Uh, another one is that. Uh, you mentioned that some things move. Shadows actually move a lot during, uh, uh, especially at, at noon. I've tried doing some panoramas where it may take two minutes to go all the way around. When I come back to the beginning, the shadows have moved several inches. Uh, well, at least maybe an inch or something like that. Uh, but, but you see, by the technique I do is actually classic single, it's not stitching, yeah? Uh, so, uh, stitching is a different world, and I'm not uh, that much, and I'm not into 360 degree whatsoever. But there's more an artistic, personal preference, so uh, nothing wrong with it, yeah? Uh, one of the other things that you mentioned was computational photography. Uh, there's been a course over at SIGGRAPH about a month ago, basically a whole day course, and uh, the notes of that are available. Um, uh, you know, either from SIGGRAPH, I have access to them. There's also a video of the entire course, which I can make available to people, too. Uh, another resource... Is it is, online, the video? I believe that they were planning on making it online, available online to SIGGRAPH members. Uh, they had done that last year. I'm not sure whether they're doing it this year. Is it on DVD or something? Uh, you can actually purchase it. Uh, from SIGGRAPH on DVD. Okay. I think you can get it from the SIGGRAPH website. The other resource is that uh, Reinhardt has a book on HDR imaging in case anybody is interested in getting it. It has a CD-ROM in it with uh, source code for a whole bunch of tone mapping operators. And you can test out several dozen tone, tone mapping operators. I'm told that the, the SIGGRAPH technical papers, presentations, and I believe the courses are available on a one-off purchase. So you can buy just one course or one lecture or something like that. It's true, yeah. But, but again, uh, that's uh, the difference. I live today, I want to make photos today. So I, I'm not interested in any source code of any, uh, for me personally as a photographer, I want to get it ready in Photoshop or in tools which are there. That's, uh, I, but. But I'm very happy that many people work on it now, yeah? But uh, I, I want to encourage everyone doing nice things and I can use them. That's, uh, but my technique works today. That's uh, the only thing. So how long do you take to post-process your photos, the, the little slideshow that you showed us? Uh, how much more is compared to processing one photo? Oh, oh, don't ask me. I, I, I posted recently on my site, which I call uh, walk portfolios. And walk portfolios are defined that I create a portfolio from walking a street in San Francisco, an area in San Francisco, whatever. And I write down how many pictures I took, uh, how long the walk took. Let's assume the walk takes 45 to one hour. 
I get about after six hours a preliminary portfolio from it after post-processing. So there's a lot of work. For example, the last you saw were a walk on Saturday in uh, San Francisco. I got the 40D one day before. This was a walk. It was about 45 to one hour, minutes to one hour. And I probably worked four hours, but I just processed the middle exposure. And I'm now in processing some real HDRs from it. So it is factor 10 longer, but the factor 10 is mainly to the lack of workflow support for it. Yeah? It, it, it has nothing to do inherently. For example, I could probably outline that a software could do what I do manually. There is just no software which does that. For example, the software could tell me, oh, this overexposed shot has motion blur. No problem for a software to detect that. Yeah? If there are actually interesting things uh, which may evolve that they may get the sharpness from the underexposed shot, if, apply it to the overexposed. I, you know? There are many things to do. Then it could say, say OK, we, we merge the, the lower and the middle. Or no, it doesn't really work. Take this one. Yeah? Let's assume it would do that. And I could say batch process. Yeah? Then I was there. So I wouldn't have to look. But there are too many factors where I have to look in the moment. Yeah? So that's a bad thing. The disk manufacturers love it because I, I, I shoot more than ever. I, have all, I shoot now in two months what I shot in a year, yeah, because it's time three. And it's not so easy to get rid of shots because couldn't be this shot be interesting if you would do this, yeah? Uh, which means sitting there, yeah? In the moment, the most effective workflow is actually I sit in bridge, have the three images selected, and just open Photoshop merge to HDR from there. But I could also from bridge, let's assume I find out, oh, damn, chromatic aberrations. I would open all three shots in camera raw, correct chromatic aberration, and then, then run merge to HDR. So I'm, yeah, for example, Lightroom is wonderful, but it doesn't help me at all with it, because I couldn't select three images and drop it somewhere, and they would do something, at least not in the moment, yeah? So, uh, it's, it's a lot more workflow, uh, work. But it, it's, it's I, I, I don't think I had that much fun for a long time. And for, also for the special reason we are not good in getting up early. So the morning, the good morning light is very often beyond us. <laughs> but on the other side, uh, think of the following. You are at, try to do San Francisco at good morning light. These are high houses. You, you, you have just always shadow. I don't know whether this is ideal light. So for what we do, the sun is actually good. Yeah? You just have to, to uh, manage it. It is kind of interesting that I got before scenes in San Francisco I've done many, 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 many times. I was never satisfied that I thought, oh, looks nice. There's a, you know this building in San Francisco where on one side is a jazz mural and on the other side is Chinatown theme, uh, themes mural. And it's always in sun when I'm there. And it, I got now wonderful images of it and I love it. It's all done with the same technique. So I tried to get other people excited and it started with, Misusing these high-speed cameras not for action, for stills, yeah? But it makes a di big difference, you know, because it's just, you know, bing, it's there, the three shots, yeah? And this little 40D, it's there, yeah? So, uh, but the post-processing is, you know, I could have five extra lives to just work in post-processing, so which means my backlog gets bigger. It's just three years, so it's, it's okay. Thank you very much.